on today's episode of Real History Online. I actually found out not too long ago from one of my relatives that on my, on my dad's side, we had a relative who I believe is one of my great grandpas, and he served on the logistical side on the railroad. And he was actually wounded through an air bombardment, but he survived the war. So, I mean, I'm, I'm here because he survived. So, definitely something to keep in mind. And when you think of war and conflict, you have to understand just how important the logistics are. Because for every one soldier at the front, you need, I think, eight or nine people who are supporting that soldier through artillery, food, transportation, fuel. And uh, there's a good saying, generals, good generals, they, they study logistics, which fundamentally wins wars, especially in, in modern age and World War II, where there were millions and millions of soldiers. The invasion of Barbarossa was four million soldiers. Four million, that's... It's a crazy number. Like I said previously, this museum is dedicated not only to the military side of things, but to, to the participants and the contributions of average people who have really nothing to do with the military. This room specifically is the logistical side. So, many people know that these factories were moved from Ukraine and from Western Soviet Union all the way to the Urals and hundreds of thousands of people with them. And they recreated this wagon, which is actually on legitimate railroad tracks. And one of thousands and thousands of such wagons, which moved entire factories and tons of people so we can step inside and take a look at what it must have been like so we have a little oven here which would basically warm up this entire entire wagon that would be filled with people and again there's no luxuries here it was the bare basics like i mean they have hay here it's like fundamentally people just live to survive. And as tough as this looks, it was better than to stay and, and, and die during the actual war. Moving on, we see what is a representation of a factory, a manufacturing facility. It's kind of hard to tell where this would be, but at this point, it would probably be in Siberia. And I'll give you an example. We have people, or, or basically children at this point, as young as 12 years old, who the gun is people shot. In my opinion, the best submachine gun of the war. The guy can barely hold it. They, these people were extremely malnourished. There was very little food to go around, and yet they worked 12 hours a day to support the war effort. And like I said, this manufacturing of weapons was more important, was extremely important. Again, you think your t job is tough? Try working 12 hours a day or more, 14 hours a day with barely any food in the cold. It's, it's a completely different life. And this is why the museum is called the work of the people, because it's really the people that came together that made this a victory. Because without these little pieces, the war would have gone the other way. The sign behind me says, Все для фронта, все для победы, which translates to everything for the front and everything for victory, which, which was the absolute truth of the moment, where every little piece of action and something that was called total war, which is an interesting concept. Total war is the state of a nation where almost all contribution is towards the war effort. So there's nothing being manufactured for civilian uses anymore. It was all for the war effort. And I really like this portion here because they have some really interesting authentic pieces. 
Not sure what engine this is, but I think this could be from Il2 maybe, Illusion. Although I'm not an engine expert, but this looks 100% authentic. It's quite a fascinating room for anybody who's a mechanic or technician. And I like the use of actual details and actual authentic pieces here. Of course, when it comes to war, there's a great amount of casualties, both physically, mentally, and I believe that any nation that can repair people, heal them, it's more people that they could use as soldiers again. And in the Soviet Union, they were quite good in their medical services. So I believe the Soviet Union had one of the highest ratios of soldiers returning back to the front after being wounded. And this is due to their medical policies. So this is quite a fascinating museum. Behind me, it looks like there's an operation going on. I read, statistically speaking, that these doctors would work again 12, 14 hours a day and trying to help people, trying to fix them. They just took out a piece of shrapnel or a bullet out of this individual. And at a time in the 1940s, before penicillin, there would be, it would be incredibly difficult to survive any kind of infection. And I know that penicillin did originate sometime during the Second World War or prior to it, but the Soviet Union had to create their own version of penicillin. Now, we take these things for granted because you know, now you get sick, you get a cut, it gets, if, even if it gets infected, you take antibiotics, nobody looks at it twice. But back then, when you're in the dirt, snow, mud, and you get a cut or a wound and it gets infected, you can die, right, without antibiotics. So this analog of penicillin was incredibly important. And like I said, these medical services saved millions of lives. So must have been hell of an ordeal being a doctor or, or a nurse. And uh, if you look at Soviet culture, you often see representations of nurses dragging soldiers and medics because they they were extremely heroic. Imagine being a hungry woman or young girl, like in the, her 20s or 19, 18 years old, and you have to go on this crazy intense battlefield and drag soldiers out to, to get them behind the front line and, and to, get them, to get them healed again. And again, I can't say this enough, but it's, it's incredibly heroic what these people went through in order to for us to enjoy our lives today and in order for me to go through this museum and comment on it because without these actions I wouldn't be here and none of none of Slavic people would be here that would be Polish Russians Ukrainians we'd, we'd be terminated so appreciate what you have guys